and um, we are going to be recording this, so if anybody's missing anything, you'll be able to catch it on the recording. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the WGBC webinar series. My name is Danny Glazer, and I'm one of the organizers of the WGBC program. My partners, Neil Cutler and Scott Fernquist, are on the call and helping with today's program. The purpose of the webinar series is to engage members more directly on a variety of topics that will help advance sustainability efforts in the Westchester County business community. I'm trying to advance my slide. There we go. Today's webinar will provide a brief introduction to the Westchester Green Business Challenge program, followed by Mark's presentation and Q&A. Please submit your questions in the question box during the webinar. We'll try to answer as many as possible on this call, and if not, Mark will get back to you after the presentation. As I mentioned, 78 people registered for today's call, and we'll do our best to get your questions answered. The webinar will be recorded and posted on the WGBC website. The WGBC program is designed to help all 35,000 Westchester County businesses go green. It is a public-private partnership between Westchester County government and the Business Council of Westchester. It's a free program that helps businesses save money, improve the environment, and promote your success. We are grateful to our sponsors, Con Edison, a platinum level sponsor, Pernod Ricard USA, a bronze level sponsor, and the sponsor of today's webinar, Mark Carell of Climate Change and Environmental Services. Currently, there are over 230 registered companies and green vendors participating in the program, as well as 19 case studies that show, showcase best industry practices. So as far as our year two goals, and we are in uh, year two of the program, um, one is to provide a very user-friendly program. Our new web platform, which will be unveiled within the next week or so, our new web platform will allow you to log on, submit or update your scorecard online, post a case study, and if you're a green product or service provider, get listed in the green business directory. We've made it easy to choose green strategies that suit your business and ways to accomplish them. We provide measurement tools for tenants and building owners alike and have partnered with the EPA for third-party benchmarking. The webinar and the breakfast series are examples of the educational services that we offer to help your business become even greener. A few announcements, uh, upcoming events. On February 16th, we are having another Mastering the Green Business Challenge Breakfast, and the title is How Industry Associations Can Help Members Go Green. It will be at Anton's of Westchester in Elmsford, and it's from 8 to 10 in the morning. And right now we have about 115 people registered for the breakfast, so uh, we encourage you to come and encourage you to RSVP. The next event will be our next webinar in this series, and the title will, is on March 1st. The title is Going Green Through Virtualized Unified Communications, and it will be presented by Stephen Brown of Mitel, which is mitel, M-I-T-E-L dot com, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about their company. And finally, the, we're having our second annual recognition event. Last year's was in June and at the Jacob Burns, and it will be again in the late spring. And it will recognize companies who have taken the exceptional steps toward operating more sustainably. And we encourage you to submit your scorecards by March 31st in order to be considered for recognition. And if you're interested in sponsoring a webinar, such as the one that we're having today, then you can contact us. And um, this information of how to contact Neil or Scott or myself is also on the Westchester Green Business Challenge website, which is westchestergov.com slash green challenge. And finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark Carell. Mark has been a participant and an advocate of the WGBC program from day one. He is the founder and principal of the environmental consulting firm Climate Change and Environmental Services, LLC. Mark got his Bachelor's of Science degree from New York University and Master's of Science in Biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin, Go Badgers, and in Chemical Engineering from Columbia University. 
Mark is a licensed professional engineer and a certified energy manager. He has over 25 years of experience in the environmental, energy, and sustainability fields, working for the US EPA and as an environmental consultant for industry. His main areas of expertise are air quality, climate change, carbon footprinting, energy, and sustainability. And now we're going to hand the controls over to Mark. Unless, Scott, unless you're doing that. All right, Mark, you're unmuted. Okay. Now I'm okay. unmuted. Yep. Okay, so I should be uh, starting right now. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Is is your? Let me just change the presenter. Okay. Because um, I'm not sure that people can see your screen. Okay. Okay. okay Tell me if that worked. Now? Okay. You should have the tools. Okay. There you go. Can everybody see the screen now? See the slide. Okay, I'm going to assume everybody yes, can see I, it. I see them. I see them. Okay, We're good. good. So okay. I'll get started. And thank you very much, Danny, for the nice introduction. And yeah, go Badgers, for sure. Um, again, the title of this talk is The Direct Financial Benefits to Reducing Your uh, Carbon Footprint and First Steps. And yes, I am Mark Carell. And it is uh, with one R, by the way, but no, uh, no problem. Now let's see. Let's see how advanced. There you go. I'll just do the quick commercial and get over with since Danny really talked about it. But uh, my company, CCS, we're an experienced Westchester-based firm, and we're dedicated to help companies, municipalities, universities, hospitals take climate change uh, challenges and turn them to their financial advantage. And you can read the rest of it there. Basically, this presentation is divided into three parts. The first part is going to talk about the basics of climate change, the challenges of climate change. The second part will talk about the advantages, the direct financial advantages to businesses to participate, to address these challenges in climate change and how they could actually take advantage of it. And the third part of this presentation will be about first steps. What If you've decided to do a green program, a sustainability program, climate change program, whatever you want to call it, what are the prudent first steps that are going to raise the chances of success and also be more cost effective, instead of just throwing yourself into it. So I think there's going to be a lot of useful information here. Now, I never know what kind of an audience I speak to. In fact, usually the audiences I speak to are a mix of people who just know a few basics about climate change, maybe from the newspapers or the TV, uh, ranging all the way up to people who are really, really educated. So I like to start off my talks often with this um, one factoid that I think is going to be an interesting fact for everybody. I think very few people are going to know this. And take a look at this slide here. Don't have to worry about the details of the slide. This is a picture of the front page of a journal article that was published in a very uh, uh, famous, well-known uh, scientific journal all about climate change, all about the concept of gases in our atmosphere being able to absorb radiation and convert it and release it as heat in the atmosphere. Uh, they refer to it as hothouse gases in this article, but we call it greenhouse gases, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But the interesting thing, if you could see it, if you see there are two small horizontal lines. In between is the date of this publication, April 1896. Now, people usually think of climate change as a new thing. Who talked about climate change 10 years ago or more, or some people may say 20 years ago or more? No one talked about it. But yeah, we did talk about climate change. At least the scientific community was aware of climate change, even back to 1896. And of course, this article refers to articles that were written earlier in the 19th century. So. To the scientific community, climate change is not a new concept, but as a society, we're all still learning and, and adjusting to it. OK, so why are we concerned uh, with climate change? The reason is global warming is happening. There's no question about it. And, and the, really, a very strong majority of the scientific community understands that. In the 20th century, the average global temperature rose 1.1 degree. And it's statistically real. It wasn't a fluke. 2000 was a particularly warm year or anything like that. The temperature gradually rose over the century. And you might think, well, what's a degree among friends, right? What's one degree? But that's actually a lot of heat. If you look at the total Earth's surface, for it to gain one degree in a century is quite a bit of heat being trapped. And in fact, looking at glacial studies, this is the biggest rise in a century going back a number of millennia. And the modelers are trying to predict the future. And they're seeing only an acceleration of this rate of heating possibly as much as another four-degree rise 
in the next 35 years. If this warning, warming continues, there will be long-term effects on the things that you see here, and basically on our economy and on our way of life, to make a long story short. Cumulatively, we call these effects climate change. And I want to just spend a minute to talk about the terminology. Uh, the, the term climate change, the term global warming, or you sort of use interchangeably, really that's not good. Uh, global warming is really a, a passe phrase. Climate change is really the correct phrase. And the phrase that's used by now all of the agencies in charge, the media is a little slow, I think, adapting. There is a difference between the two. And I'll illustrate it with an example. I'll sort of ask a question. I, you know, obviously, I won't be able to hear your answers. But my question is, how many people here have lived in or ever visited Barcelona, Spain? And I'm sure some of you probably have in your travels. Well, Barcelona is considered a warm weather city. People go in the winter and vacation there to warm up. And in fact, the average annual temperature in Barcelona, taking the seasons into consideration, nighttime, daytime, and all, is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, if you took a map or a globe of the world or what have you and take a look at Barcelona and follow it, you'll see that it has the same latitude, which means it gets the same amount of sun hitting it at the same angle as Boston, Massachusetts, which we, of course, think of as a cold weather city here in New York or here in the Northeast. And in fact, the average annual temperature in Boston is about 50 and a half degrees, again, taking night and day into consideration and the seasons and all that. So why should two cities that have the same latitude, get the same amount of sun, have such a discrepancy in temperature. There is a reason behind it, a natural reason, and that is the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is a warm a water stream that starts in the Gulf of Mexico, goes around Florida, and goes up north the Atlantic, northeast, and goes off the coast of uh, Western Europe. It's got a lot of warmth, and the warmth diffuses throughout the water and even into the air, and as fronts cross the Atlantic, it picks up that heat, and that's why Barcelona is 9.5 degrees warmer than Boston. Well, the climate change scientists are predicting, in fact, we're actually seeing that the glaciers in the Arctic are beginning to melt. So now you've got cold water melting from the glaciers, mixing into the Arctic Ocean and into the North Atlantic. And there's now predictions, and models or computer models are showing that eventually, in time, this uh, cold water is going to mix in and perhaps even neutralize the warmth of the effect of the Gulf, St Gulf Stream, perhaps even neutralizing it completely. So now the prediction is that in Western Europe, and in fact in Barcelona, the temperature will not rise as global warming would say it would, but actually will probably de decrease a little bit because we're negating the effect of the, uh, the Gulf Stream. So again, that's why we use the word climate change. Global warming will not be uniform around the world, although probably most of the world, but the climate will change. OK, and speaking of the glaciers melting, here's a pretty vivid example. These are sea ice minimum photographs from 1979 and 2005. You can see pretty uh, readily that uh, particularly the area north of Russia, north of Siberia and Russia, has uh, exhibited quite a bit of melt uh, in, again, during the summertime. Okay. Here's a graphic that shows the potential impacts of climate change. The, the ones on the top are the direct effects. For most of the world, the temperature will rise, which means the sea level will rise and there will be more evaporation and therefore precipitation. But the bottom shows the indirect effects. And in fact, uh, I won't go through all of these. Certainly time doesn't allow me. But the one I think is interesting, it gets very little publicity, but I think has going to have an enormous effect on the world is in the left side on health, and particularly excuse me, infectious diseases. Uh, there's a number of diseases. Malaria is one of them that's spread by insects, which of course are cold-blooded animals. They could only live in a certain band around the equator. Well, if we have this predominant global warming, the mosquitoes are going to be able to go further north or further south, if it's south of, of the equator, and potentially infect hundreds of millions of additional people who've not been exposed to that particular mosquito before. And there are dire predictions that down the road, you know, several decades down the road, we may have a major increase in diseases such as malaria. And are we prepared to deal with it? All, again, related to this global warming or climate change. And of course, you see there's many other impacts that will have a tremendous impact on our lives and, and on our economy and the world economy. OK, so what's behind the uh, climate change? What's causing this climate change? Well, there's certain compounds in the atmosphere, in the atmosphere that we breathe in every day, that have the capability of trapping radiation or releasing it as heat. We call them greenhouse gases or GHGs. They come from natural sources, but they also come from man-made sources. The main greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide, CO2. 
uh, CO2 levels, uh, according to glacial studies, have been pretty uh, steady, uh, about 280 parts per million for a number of millennium. In the last 125 years, it's risen almost 40 percent. It's currently about 385 parts per million, from 280 to 385 parts per million. And that rise correlates with our increased use of fossil fuels, more cars, things like that. Combustion of fossil fuels releases carbon as carbon dioxide. And right now, a huge majority of scientists believe that man-made emissions of greenhouse gases at least contribute significantly, maybe not solely, but definitely significantly, to the climate change effect. Here is a diagram, an illustration that shows uh, the greenhouse gas effect. The sun beats down, releases a variety of radiations. Of course, we know visible light. That's what we used to see. But a lot of the radiation, besides being absorbed by the Earth, also reflects off the Earth goes through the atmosphere and goes back into outer space. That's why we could see the moon. That's why we could see planets, light hitting, visible light hitting those bodies in uh, space and reflecting and going through the atmosphere to us. Same thing here. However, some of this radiation at certain wavelengths are capable of being absorbed by certain greenhouse gases uh, and therefore retaining that energy, released as heat and all that. Uh, we now have more greenhouse gases than we have ever had, so therefore there is more retention of the energy and more release of heat. Uh, and so this is uh, essentially an illustration that summarizes the greenhouse gas effect. I, I want to correct two simplifications in this diagram. Diagrams are great, you know, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, but there are some, a couple of some, uh, oversimplifications here. The first thing is it shows greenhouse gases as a band over the Earth. It, and, and that's not true. Greenhouse gases are everywhere in the atmosphere. We breathe greenhouse gases. Fortunately, they're not toxic, at least not at the concentration we breathe them in. But they're everywhere. The second thing, oversimplification with this uh, diagram, is it shows the sun is shining only on Germany, not on France or Italy or our friends in Barcelona or anything like that. And have we figured out by now that's a joke? Just want to make sure everybody is awake and paying attention. Obviously, it was a German illustrator, right? And again, this is a, a diagram that illustrates how greenhouse gases work in trapping radiation, releasing it as heat, and we have more of it, so there's more of this retention. Okay, so what do we have to do? We've got a problem here with climate change, those dire effects I talked about. A huge majority of scientists in the field believe that we could still reverse most of the problems of climate change if we could reduce emissions of greenhouse gases drastically. Greenhouse gases have a lifetime in the atmosphere. They eventually essentially disappear or round it themselves out. And the calculation is we should have a 70 to 80 percent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere based on the 1990 baseline by the year 2050. If we can do this, we could probably reverse most of the effects of climate change. But if we don't, we may reach a tipping point where no amount of greenhouse gases will force to stall the effects of climate change. So that sounds like good news. I mean, uh, yeah, let's just plant some more trees. We'll drive some hybrids. We'll bring the greenhouse gas emissions out. And we've got 40 years to do it. So you know, we could uh, party a little bit and then maybe get serious, right? Uh, it didn't take long to go to the moon, so we've got 40 years here. But not so fast. There's one big cloud o over our heads when it comes to this, and that's a demographic cloud. And here it is. Right now, we have 7 billion people on Earth. And 1 billion people, I like to call it, they live like us. They drive cars. They heat or air condition their homes with a touch of a button. They have toys. They have iPhones. They have TVs. They have uh, everything uh, you can imagine. We're high energy users. The predictions are that by 2050, we'll have 9 billion people. But maybe more important, we're going to have 3 billion people on Earth who live like us, 2 billion more high energy users. Uh, and an example of that is what's going on right now in China, the tremendous growth going on right now in China. Uh, we're seeing stories all the time of people trading in their bicycles for cars as they reach the middle class. China, India, Brazil, Russia has a tremendous burgeoning middle class, poor people going to the middle class, and they see what we, the way we live in the West and the U.S., and they want to live like us. So how can we provide this high-energy lifestyle for 2 billion more people on Earth and yet also reduce global greenhouse gases by 70 80 percent? That's a real difficult task in front of us. So how do we reduce greenhouse gases? Well, this is a global problem. We need a global reduction of greenhouse gases. And the philosophy involved basically says that it doesn't matter where the greenhouse gas emission reductions occur, 
even if it's far away, it's still good. So whether you reduce it in White Plains or Yonkers or Honolulu or wherever, it's good news. The other approach is a market-based approach. Have some kind of incentives for companies, for people, for institutions, what have you, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Have there be a goal, but let there be incentives to go beyond the goal to sponsor reductions, however it could be done. One of the concepts also involves something called cap and trade, which is very much in the news. I could probably do a whole presentation on this, but we'll go with this uh, illustration to summarize. Basically, in traditional uh, in regulation, you tell a company, here's your emission cap. Bring down your emissions to this emission cap, and that's, and that's it. That's your only option. Uh, you have to do it, no matter how costly, and there's no incentive to go and beyond. But in cap and trade, you really have three options. As you see, company one can go beyond the emission cap. They could reduce their emissions to below the emission cap by, let's say, in this case, 10 units, whatever those units are. And their reward is they could take those 10 units and have them as developed as credits and be able to sell them on the market. And then you've got a company like company two who thinks it's just too expensive to reach the cap. So they're going to go over the cap, but they've got to find credits to buy to make up for, in this case, it's plus 10 over the emission cap. So company two can approach company one or any other company that has credits and make a deal and, and buy it. So this gives companies more flexibility to meet the cap, go above the cap and pay a financial price, or go below the cap and actually get some money back for their investment in reducing uh, CO2 emissions. So that's what cap and trade is, and that's a part of many uh, of the regulatory schemes around the world when it comes to greenhouse gases. Where do we stand in the U.S.? Well, there is no federal greenhouse gas emission reduction legislation. Never passed. There are a number of programs, though, throughout the U.S., at the state level, at the regional level, and at the county and city level that require or at least um, give incentives to companies to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And certainly the Westchester Green Business Challenge is an example of that. Plus, there's economic and social dr drivers that make a greenhouse gas reduction program beneficial. I want to take a moment to talk about the word sustainability. Uh, it is used interchangeably, and probably rightfully so, with climate change. What is sustainability? You've probably heard the word a lot. It's the ability of a business, for a business or a municipality or what have you to thrive, to make money, but at the same time conserve resources for future generations and for that own business to enjoy. Sometimes it's also called going green, sustainability, going green. It's composed of climate change. It's composed of energy concerns but also cons uh, considers others in its basket, such as water conservation, land conservation, resources. Don't use up all your resources. Recycle, things like that. So that's sustainability. I'm going to use that term with climate change and green sort of uh, interchangeably. OK, now we're at the next uh, part, the second part of, of this presentation. And that is the nine purely business reasons to have a robust green program why businesses, hospitals, universities, municipalities should have a green or sustainability program. It's good for you business-wise. So none of these reasons are going to talk about the, the, the Arctic ice cap melting or the polar bears or anything like this or those effects of climate change we talked about earlier, purely uh, business reasons. The first one, of course, when we're talking about business, we're talking about making money. Actions to reduce your electricity and fuel usage will reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. And given the rising cost of energy, will save you a lot of money. And there's a particular value in reducing your energy costs. And here's an example, a very simple example. If you can save 10000 a year in energy costs, that's less than 1000 a month. That's 10000 a year right in your pocket, right adding on to the profit margin. What's the, what's the other way to make money? Well, increasing your sales. Typical product makes 10% profit. That means you have to increase your sales by 100000 a year to get the money, the increased profits, that reducing your energy cost by 10000 a year would do, which is easier. It's, it may vary from company to company, but I think most companies are going to find it easier to reduce your energy cost by 10000 than to increase sales by 100000 And then the third benefit is once you install the technologies or uh, install the options and strategies to reduce the energy costs, it's there forever. You, uh, the savings occur every year, and in fact, the savings actually increase because the unit cost of energy goes up. Uh, where sales, of course, after that first year of sales, you've got to go back and do the sales all over again. So to me, it's a no-brainer that you should have a good energy reduction, greenhouse gas reduction program, and you'll make money. And here's a case study. These are DuPont's numbers, but DuPont claims they invested $200 million in energy upgrades in the 1990s. Didn't have to. They weren't required by any law, 
but they just felt it was a good investment. And according to them, their cost savings now are over $300 million a year in avoided energy costs because of these upgrades they did in the 1990s. Now, I'm not an MBA. I don't, I'm not a Wall Street guy. But to me, uh, take away the word million. If you had a $200 investment and you made $300 per year, I'm not sure there are too many investments that are as good as that you can find on Wall Street. Maybe Facebook, uh, an early investor might do as well or better, but uh, not too much. So to me, energy uh, investing in an energy reduction program is a great rate, going to be a great return. Uh, next one, uh, number two of our nine purely business reasons: create new products, rebrand, new product options, or rebrand existing products to address the changing consumer interest in green. Here's a couple of uh, case studies. GE has a line of product called Eco Imagination, which is essentially old products that have been rebranded to the green market. And once they did that, their product sales doubled within three years. Another case study is small businesses. There's a really good store called Green Design Expo in Westchester in Scarsdale, uh, a business specifically selling green products and educating people on the best green products available for their needs. So again, it's creating a whole new line of business uh, that will, for the most part, I think, be very successful. Reason number three is to impress customers and impress suppliers. A growing number of customers want to know the impacts of their products, the environmental impacts of the products they buy. So what has developed is something called the carbon footprint, which I'll explain in a moment. It's the amount of greenhouse gases emitted in the life cycle of a product. And uh, it could put a product with a, uh, a low, uh, small carbon footprint in a more competitive sales position. A case study is Walmart, of course, is the biggest retailer in the world. They're in the process of asking their suppliers for life cycle greenhouse gas emission information, and they're going to put it on their shelves. So there may be tags that say for every uh, ounce of beverage or whatever an ounce of product, this emitted you know, 50 grams of greenhouse gases. And, and maybe the competitor will be 80 grams for, per ounce, and therefore uh, it might be advantageous for the brand that's 50 uh, grams. Of course, when Walmart uh, speaks, it gets a lot of uh, people uh, interested. Okay, here's an example. Here's an illustration of a carbon footprint. Someone actually drew a foot and took the different parts of the foot and represented the different areas of a life cycle called the carbon footprint. I'm going to show you another example that I think is a little better right now. Concentrate on the six brown arrows at the top. Those really represent the stages of a typical life cycle of a product, any product. Think about a product you have right now, maybe a pen in your hand, a, a shirt or blouse that you're wearing, the chair you're sitting in something like that. Think of about a product. It's composed of investment in the infrastructure, new investment design, the raw materials that make it up, supply chain, the actual fabrication, production, distribution, the trucking of the raw materials to the factory and from the factory to the store, then sales and consumer end use, and finally, recycling end of life. Greenhouse gas emissions can occur anywhere in those six portions of the product life cycle. And by understanding it for a given product, it could teach you a lot about the product and, and how to address greenhouse gas emission reduction issues. I'm going to give you a little quiz now, a very quick quiz. A major, manu a major manufacturer of kitchen appliances, refrigerators, clothes washers, clothes dryers, dishwashers, ranges, stoves, did a greenhouse gas emission inventory along their product life cycle. They looked at these six portions, and they found out from their calculations that 95% of their greenhouse gas emissions occurred in one of these six <coughs> me, stages, the other 5% being spread out for the other five. So my question for you is, what do you think is that stage that uh, accounted for 95% of the greenhouse gas emissions for kitchen appliances? I won't put on the Jeopardy music, but I'll give you a couple more second, couple seconds to think about it. And the answer is the fifth one, and that is sales and consumer end use. Uh, that refrigerator that you have in your kitchen is on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, uh, uh, using electricity, which means some power plant somewhere is burning a fossil fuel, very possibly burning a fossil fuel, to keep your food cool or, or cold in the freezer or what have you. And other appliances use a fair amount of energy, electricity, of, any, of all types, uh, while it's being used in the, life, in the life cycle. And that's much, much greater than the one-time manufacturing, the one-time trucking of it, and, and even the recycling or end of life of it. Very interesting. So it taught that company that, hey, we don't have to look at 
greenhouse gas emissions of the other, because it accounts for less than 5%. Let's make our products more energy efficient, and we'll achieve a very good greenhouse gas emission reduction. Let me give you one more quick example, one more quick quiz. A major yogurt manufacturer, everybody's eating yogurt, right? So just imagine a cup of yogurt and the product life cycle involved with a cup of yogurt from the beginning to the end of life. A company that manufactures yogurt did a greenhouse gas emission inventory along its life cycle and found out that 70% of its greenhouse gas emissions came from one of these six stages. The other 30% was spread among the other five. And you might want to take a guess on what that one uh, element is, one portion of the product life cycle is for 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions from a cup of yogurt. Can I give you a couple more, a few more seconds? I was sitting in the audience when the speaker went, uh, went through this, and I had thought there was going to be distribution. The trucking, these refrigerated trucks going hundreds of miles, thousands of miles from the factory to the uh, refrigerators at the uh, supermarkets was going to be it, but it wasn't. The answer is the supply chain, or to be more specific, the cows. The emissions from the cows uh, accounted uh, for quite a bit of greenhouse gas emissions, and I was at 70%. So what that company did as a result of the study is they started to work with their farmers who supply them with their milk and offered uh, or actually made requirements that they feed their cows a certain mix of grains that would minimize the production of gas, of greenhouse gases. So again, that's their way of being more direct and, and more efficient in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. So again, that's all about life cycle, product life cycle analysis. Let's go back to our nine purely business reasons to have a green program. Number four, raise employee morale. There's a lot of talk in the business world that there's now recognized a significant cost in replacing a worker who leaves a company, a valued worker who leaves a company. It takes time to find a replacement, train that replacement, and the lost productivity. A company with a green plan, a green program, gives workers a new devotion to the firm. And you see a case study here, this quote by Ray Anderson, I should say the late Ray Anderson, Ray just passed away in 2011. In addition, research shows that buildings that are green, and I'll talk about it later, uh, will result in greater productivity of your employers and reduced sick days. So again, raising employee morale, which definitely has an impact on business, and being green does that. Number five, fast-tracking important projects. A climate change and sustainability program can allay the fears of a community or regulatory agency and uh, can certainly be used uh, as a counter to citizen groups that may object to certain projects. A very good example is a company called TXU down in Texas. They put out a plan where they wanted to build a number of new power plants, several of which burning coal, which of course is very much of a no-no. Environmental groups were very much against it and fought very hard. But what they offered was to put together a climate change program where there'll be a net decrease in greenhouse gas emissions, taking all these power plants in the, into consideration, even with the coal-fired plants. And by doing that, the environmental groups actually signed off and agreed on it, and it saved them a lot of money, certainly, in avoided litigation. Next one, number six, is to improve efficiency, improve flexibility. Using less fuel, using less electricity to uh, do your operations certainly improves efficiency. Everybody wants that. It also Fuel flexibility reduces risks of future fuel shortages. And imagine that you can improve efficiency and it can be paid by others, such as Con Edison or NYSERDA in the New York area, or by others across the country. Now, the case studies I've given up to now are big mega firms. I thought it would give a little uh, uh, shout out here to a much smaller company. Uh, and that's uh, this one is called Kid City in Mount Vernon, New York, in Westchester County. It's a retailer of children's items, as you can imagine. They underwent a lighting audit and improved their efficiency. It was partially paid for by NYSERDA, so they didn't have to pay a lot out of their pockets. It saved them $2,800 a year in electricity costs, nothing to sneeze at. But what was interesting is it ended up leading to increased sales. They shut down the store for a couple of weeks to put in the new ballots and new electricity uh, and new fixtures and everything. And it turned out the, uh, the installers not only put in the more efficient bulbs, but they also pointed it more at the uh, clothing, at the materials they were selling, and all of a sudden, pun aside, everything was, uh, the things for sale were at a better light, and sales increased. So that was a little extra thing, that, uh, benefit that they did not uh, expect by having this green program. Number seven is climate change risks. There are many potential effects of climate change. 
the sea level rise we talked about, heat, more severe storms that will impact businesses. This represents a major change of philosophy. It used to be we're always concerned with how a company affects the environment, with a water uh, hazardous waste or, or wastewater that's discharged or pollutants into the air. Now we're concerned with how the environment affects business. This represents both risk and opportunity. And a case study uh, is there's a European company that did modeling studies to predict future temperatures. And they concluded that the farmers who currently produce their raw materials will no longer be able to do so in about 20 years. Or it should say the yield will be so much lower that it won't be very good. So it led them to change their thinking a little bit about how they have contracts and who they're going to actually contract with to reduce their raw materials. Climate change risk. And here's a couple of examples of, of really physical effects that occur now. I'm not saying that these effects that you see here are because of climate change, but really what we're saying from the beginning of this talk is that climate change will increase the frequency of events like this. Now look at the one in the upper left corner. Imagine if you were a work or a manager uh, officer for a big company and you make widgets or what have you, and you've got to get your product to market, and then your train comes across this area. Well, the train's not going to go, and therefore your product's not going to go to market, or your raw materials will not reach your manufacturing site, or what have you. So this is very severe, and the point is we're going to see more and more of this if climate change continues, and it's something to think about and, and for companies to prepare for as part of the green program. Okay, number eight, improving a company's image. Uh, a company's image is of growing importance. And we know, and we've seen many examples in recent years of people being very high on companies because they have a good green image and, and others having bad green images, and it affects their sales and their stock price. Okay, so you want to be on the right side. And case study is Toyota's Prius, the hybrid. At the time uh, Toyota pushed the Prius, that was a time when other uh, cars were being recalled. And Toyota was getting bad publicity. They were losing their reputation as a reliable car. All of a sudden, they put out the Prius and, and promoted it, and people forgot about the recalls that were going on. And Toyota still has a very, very good reputation because it came out very strong on the green side in terms of the Prius. And the last one is a company stock value. There have been a, actually a couple of major studies of large companies that seem to show that the lower the greenhouse gas emissions are, the higher the stock price is. Not just one or two companies, but of hundreds of companies, essentially the, the whole uh, S&P 500. So markets are speaking about risk, that those that reduce their greenhouse gas emissions or reduce their fuel usage or electricity usage have lower risk and therefore higher values uh, than companies that don't do this. So it's really uh, something that's spoken by, uh, by the markets. So those are the nine purely business reasons that have a robust green program. Again, didn't talk about um, polar bears or anything like that, but purely things that will help the bottom line of a company. Here's a bit of a summary of the climate change opportunities for firms. Action to reduce greenhouse gases will lead to direct cost savings. It shows progress to the public, to employees, to other stakeholders. It raises your social quotient. It is an opportunity to understand the physical and regulatory business risks that climate change represents. And again, it's an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to be well known. And again, ask GE with eco-imagination. Ask Toyota, and you'll probably see a big smile on their face. Now, with that in mind, I've got two poll questions. I'm going to ask the first one. I think, Neil, you're going to put it up for everyone to see, I think. OK. Uh, let's see. I think I have to press this button. Did I do it right? Well, I'm going to ask the question of which of these nine purely financial reasons for having a green program is most relevant to your business or to your employer. So remember the nine that are shown. And, and if I did press the right button, the official poll question could be up there for you to click on. So now we've finished the first two parts of this talk. The last part is, now that I've hopefully convinced you and your companies and universities and all to have a climate change sustainability program, how do you do it? What are the first steps? What are the prudent steps to do it to make sure that it's, uh, it's going to be effective? This is a very sort of noisy slide. It's got a lot of information. I could probably do a whole webinar just on this. But in summary, what you ultimately want to do determine where, what are your greenhouse gas emissions and where are they coming from. You do an emissions inventory. What's driving? What part of your business is driving your greenhouse gas emissions? An analysis, projection. That's the, uh, the life cycle analysis. Is it your transportation? Is it your raw materials, et cetera? What might your future emissions be if you're going to take over another company or, or develop new products, things like that? 
what are the implications of <coughs> excuse me of reducing your greenhouse gas emissions? What are the potential opportunities to have credits and earn money? But what are the costs involved in, in the impacts? And again, uh, what are the risks involved as well? The strategies. So go on to the next slide. Okay. So if you're going to uh, start a climate change program, a green program, sustainability program, what you need to do, a lot of people say, oh yeah, let's just jump in and, and measure our greenhouse gases. It's actually about the worst thing you can do because it's, I've seen a number of companies that have done that and it's actually led to frustration and failure. You need to do some planning. And the first part of planning is to actually develop a group focused on these issues, whether it's climate change, sustainability, what have you. It doesn't have to be a formal committee, but at least some type of a group. What's also very important is to have leadership from the top, literally from the CEO, to overcome potential vetoers within the company. And this group on climate change or sustainability should have participation from these people from these groups that I have listed there, because they're all impacted by decisions you make about energy reduction or water conservation or what have you. So go to the next slide, please. OK. So in this planning, you need to do an initial self-evaluation. You have to ask yourself, where are we now, and what are the goals of, the green, of our green program? Which of those nine reasons are most attractive to the company? Develop goals. We want to reduce energy by this much, or we want to develop these products to be for the green market, things like that. Another thing you need to do in planning is determine where are you and where are you going to be in the future. Uh, are you in good shape in certain areas leading into this program, or are you in bad shape? And what's the culture of your company? What are the barriers that might exist? that will enable you to grow in these various areas. There are uh, uh, exercises you can do, uh, and I've been involved in a few, that can help companies identify where their strong points and where their weaknesses are so we can focus on those weaknesses, allocate the resources properly, and overcome barriers. Once again, it's very important to not take planning for granted. Don't just jump in, but do this planning. Next slide, please. OK, so now. You've done your planning. Now you do your baseline greenhouse gas emission inventory. What are your energy usages? What are your greenhouse gases you're emitting? What's very, very important, and I can't emphasize this enough, is the quality of the data. Make sure the data you collect from your various facilities or operations or divisions or whatever to determine greenhouse gas emissions are complete, thorough, and consistent. And I've seen many uh, a greenhouse gas inventory come out in poor quality because there's inconsistencies between facilities or between operators or things like that. So make sure the, the information you gather is complete and thorough and, and understandable. And again, if you don't do this, you're going to have a low quality emission inventory. And you might be spending money on things that you shouldn't be spending money on. And you can do some benchmarking. You know, look at your different facilities and how they do and all that. Then the next thing you do is focus on the areas where you spend the most money on energy. And look for ways to reduce energy. Establish your return on investments and find the low-hanging fruit, the, the most effective reduction for the money spent. Next slide, please. Here's a pretty noisy slide. And, and uh, I won't go over this in a lot of detail. But if you uh, want to jot this down, you could find this and study a little bit more. If you Google uh, McKinsey greenhouse gas abatement, I think you'll be able to find this. This is a, for, uh, a summary of a major study done by the McKinsey Business Group. Look, each bar represents a different energy reduction or greenhouse gas reduction technology or strategy or option. If the bar is pointing down from that horizontal axis, it means that you're going to make money from it. You can invest the money up front, but you're going to get that money back and more. If the bar is pointing up, that means you're going to spend money, but you're not going to get it back. Again, based on the conditions you know, here. And there are exceptions to some of these. So if you look at the far left, where we have the best return on investment, it's electronics, commercial and residential electronics, you can see on the slide, that if you go out and replace your refrigerators, your laptops, your uh, printers, fax machines, whatever, with Energy Star label uh, equivalents, then you're going to get the same uh, production but reduce your energy. And you'll see it very quickly. You may spend an extra 50 or $100, but you'll get that back very, very quickly, just a matter of months, in your electricity bills. And of course, you're going to use that piece of equipment for many years, so you'll see quite a bit. The next couple over are lighting, switching from uh, incandescents to LEDs or CFLs or what have you, or T12 to T8s. Uh, again, you're getting at the same lighting, but use a lot less energy. Yeah, you've got to spend some extra money up front for the fixtures, for the bulbs, but 
you'll get it back in a pretty good time. And the next one over is cars. As cars get retired from a fleet, replace them with hybrids. And again, it's a, that's a good news proposition. Going to the right side, take a look at things like solar, afforestation, planting forests. Great way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but it's going to cost money, and there's not going to necessarily get it back. And even solar, this is based on lack of incentives. Of course, now we know many agencies give incentives uh, for solar. So again, that uh, could well change you know, on an individual basis. So once again, these are different strategies to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, all effective in doing so, but some have better economics than others. Next slide, please. OK, so again, the center of doing a, a greenhouse gas emission project is an energy audit, which we talked about earlier. Again, like DuPont, uh, investing in an energy audit, you will most likely make money, and you're going to do very, very well doing so. There's a lot of good information. The Westchester Green Business Challenge has information on how to upgrade, how to reduce fuel electricity usage. There are rebate programs in New York, and, and almost, almost every state has them as well. Another thing to look at is the buildings you work in. Uh, is it possible that they could become a LEED certified building of some way, a green building? Uh, you could look it up in the US Green Business Council, usgbc.org, all about the LEED program. Uh, I could do a whole uh, webinar just on that, but let's go to the next slide, please. This is a summary from the USGBC of the savings you can achieve by going LEED, by having a LEED certified building versus an equivalent building that's not LEED. You see it's pretty substantial in terms of cost as well as carbon emissions, water usage, et cetera. Next slide, please. Here's a case study that uh, actually I was fortunate enough to be involved in. Hopefully you recognize that picture. That's the United Nations, the headquarters of the United Nations on the east side of Manhattan. See the big secretary building there in the middle. If you see a blue arm on the right side, that's actually my arm. But anyway, uh, I was fortunate enough to be a manager on a project where uh, the UN is right now, the headquarters campus is right now going through a major renovation, their first renovation since they were built in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, it's ongoing now, and it's going to be done around 2014. And I was fortunate enough to, to manage a group of people who did a green evaluation of the architectural plan. So the architect uh, developed their plans, and we uh, developed some ideas. We came up with about 20 green ideas for them to put in, and the UN accepted about 18 of them, roughly. So that was pretty good. And you see them here, and you know, time doesn't allow me to go through them, but you can see them here. And again, there are a lot of strategies. They're putting it in, and it should lead to some good things. Next slide, please. And of course, once you have done your program and you've reduced your greenhouse gas emissions, it's important to communicate it. You can register. Probably the most significant registry is something called the Carbon Registry uh, out in California, but it's very much of a national uh, registry. Document your success on your website, an annual statement. Let your employees know. Give them the, something to talk about, something to have pride in. Talk about it at the dinner table. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a summary slide. Why should a company invest in carbon management and greenhouse gas emission reduction? Because it could be a direct money maker. We saw the economic benefits of greenhouse gas emission reductions. It responds to stakeholders. The social benefits of doing the right thing when you don't have to. It better positions yourself to examine risk. And again, it should be part of planning. It should be part of business situation. So go to the next slide. Just wrapping up, I like to end with a quote, maybe put a, get you to think a little bit, put a smile on your face, what have you. So here's an interesting one. With regard to excellence, it's not enough to know it's excellence, but we must try to have it and to use it. So not just know excellence, but to really embrace it. Sounds very modern, right? So it would be very modern. Anyone want to take a guess on who said it? Next slide, please. Not so modern. Was, this was stated, I wasn't there, but it was stated by Aristotle. So anyway, uh, I want to thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry about the little glitch that we had there uh, uh, near the end, but uh, hopefully it all came through, and uh, uh, I'm certainly available for any questions. And our Danny team. or Neil, uh, uh, I guess Neil, want to take over? Neil? Yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, this is Neil Cutler, one of the organizers of the Westchester Green Business Challenge. Mark, that was a terrific, very informative presentation. We're now going to uh, move over into the uh, Q&A part of the uh, webinar just for the last few minutes here. 
If you do want to ask a question, you can submit it via the question <coughs> portion of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and we'll ask Mark uh, a few of the questions that were submitted. Any questions we do not get to, um, they will be sent to Mark, and he will respond to you via email. So for the first one, Mark, um, someone's curious about that slide uh, with Germany uh, in the sun. <laughs> Um, why is it that the sun's radiation can get in but has trouble getting it getting out? Shouldn't it be blocked by the greenhouse gases on the way in as well? Absolutely it is. Uh, but certainly there's a net uh, uh, radiation goes through and hits the ground, and that's why the ground warms up. But uh, in, in addition, it reflects and comes out. So it is a, a two-way street without a doubt. Now, uh, someone did a study, a uh, computer study a while ago, they said if it was humanly, if it was possible to have no greenhouse gases, of course, life wouldn't exist without CO2. But if we had no greenhouse gases to trap the radiation, the average temperature on Earth would be two below zero Fahrenheit. So greenhouse gases ha actually, you know, they sort of have a bad reputation, but they actually are an important part of making the Earth the Earth and making it habitable as it is and all that. It's just that we have too too much now and uh, growing constantly. Sounds like it's a sounds like it's a fine balance. Exactly. Uh, next question, what would you say, Mark, to a manager at a company who says, I just want to wait for rules of direction from government before I act on this? Mm -hmm. it, it's for, certainly understandable. And, uh, you know, I, I've always, uh, you know, in the planning stage for a number of companies that I've worked for on having a sustainability program or the like, I always point out there really are three things you can do. You could be the leader in your industry, you could be the middle of the pack, or you could be a follower. And there's no right or wrong answer. There's certainly advantages to being a follower. But on the other hand, as I brought up here, those nine business reasons, um, well, two things. One is that, of course, there are those reasons, those economic benefits. So why not take advantage of them, uh, whether there's rules or not? If there's going to be a benefit for you, for a business, why not take advantage of it? The other thing is, no matter what direction government goes eventually when it comes to greenhouse gases, there's certain things that need to be done, like a baseline inventory, having a management system to understand what your greenhouse gases are, the amounts, where they come from. So it just makes sense to do it anyway because the rules are going to require it. They will, you know, there's certain things that uh, would be advantageous to do. So I, on some level, waiting for government could really mean missed opportunities for businesses. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is regarding the new ISO 5001 standards. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this person is uh, curious if you're seeing companies using this internally as a tool to support their programs or externally as a certification process. Well, uh, I'm seeing both. Of course, it's so new. You know, it really came out just a few months ago that we really don't know yet. But uh, the good news, at least from what I'm hearing from colleagues, is that uh, you know one of the one of the complaints or one of the reasons that uh, excuses, I should say, that companies were not doing energy conservation measures was well, we don't have a standard that we trust. Well, ISO, of course, is a very trustworthy name and trustworthy standard. So now, at least the chatter I'm hearing from colleagues is that people are assessing it. Companies are assessing ISO 50001, but uh, it seems to be that more and more of them are think that this is the way to go, that at least it gives them cover, that they have a standard that's uh, universally accepted. Got it. Uh, looks like we have time for maybe one final question. Uh, do you find that green companies are uh, experiencing benefits in their ability to recruit applicants, and particularly younger applicants, through their, uh, their being a more green company in the first place? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I've not seen statistics on it. I've just heard some anecdotal evidence. But I heard an interesting one about, oh, four years ago. I think this happened about three or four years ago. I was doing uh, some preliminary work for Princeton University. And someone there told me the story that a year before, an applicant turned down Princeton and actually went to, an Ivy League, uh, to a non-Ivy League school instead because they didn't like Princeton's green program, and they liked the green program of its other university, which really shook up the admissions office at Princeton, as you can imagine, uh, that you know, someone would actually, a student would actually use a, uh, the greenness of a university to make a decision and to choose a non-Ivy League school or choose somebody else. So that's just one uh, 
anecdotal uh, bit of evidence. But I'm sure this is going on around the country. That's a great story. Um, I see that uh, we're, we're just a hair over 1 o'clock, and I would like to keep to our schedule. There were a few other questions um, that we'll send to Mark that he can answer via email. Um, I would like to conclude our webinar at this time and uh, give a big thank you to Mark Correll, Principal of Climate Change and Environmental Services, uh, for his terrific presentation. For more information about Mark's company, you can go to ccesworld. Dot com. Also, a thank you to our program sponsors, Con Ed and Pernod Ricard, and to everyone uh, participating today in the webinar. Uh, don't forget, Thursday, February 16th, is our next breakfast workshop entitled Mastering the Green Business Challenge, How Industry Associations Can Help Members Go Green. And that will be held at Antons of Westchester from 8 to 10 a.m. And information for this event and the Westchester Green Business Challenge